We've seen how two hydrogens or two fluorines can form a bond by sharing. And we saw that they form a single bond and then the fluorines have non-bonding pairs all around them. But sometimes just sharing one pair of electrons is not enough. The first molecule that we're going to look at that in which uh, we find that sharing one pair of electrons is not enough is the simple molecule of oxygen, one of our diatomic molecules. Let's have these two oxygens come together. If I have just these two electrons shared, you can see the electron structure of oxygen, which was S2P4, would only be S2P5, not stable. If I share another pair, well then now we can get stability. The oxygens will have eight electrons on each and be S2P6, have an octet. If we rewrite it so that the electrons that are being shared are between the two nuclei, you can see the oxygen on the left has an octet and the oxygen on the right has an octet. You have to remember that the electrons that are between the two atoms are on both atoms. It's not the pair on the right is on the right atom and the pair on the left is on the left atom. It's that those two pairs are on both atoms. Both are being shared. If we look at this structure, you can see that the two pairs between, those are the bonding electrons. Those, because there's two pairs, we consider that to be a double bond. Notice one pair of electrons is a single bond, two pairs of electrons is a double bond, and three pairs would be a triple bond. The remaining electrons around the oxygen that form its octet are non-bonding pairs. Any pairs that are not between two nuclei are considered non-bonding pairs. These are very important, not only for stability, but because in chemical reactions, we often find that reactions start at the non-bonding pairs. Notice all the electrons are written as pairs. Do not draw single electrons in molecules. Single electrons are considered to be a free radical, and free radicals are unstable. I will not be giving you any unstable molecules to draw. You will only be drawing stable molecules, so all your electrons need to be in pairs. And when you count up the electrons that belong in a Lewis dot structure, notice they must be, be a, it must be an even total. If I bring two nitrogens together, you can see sharing one pair would not give an octet on each nitrogen. Sharing two pairs does not give an octet, but sharing three pairs does give an octet. If I redraw this so that the pairs are ele of electrons are between the two nitrogens, you can see that each nitrogen now has eight electrons and is stable. This is called a triple bond, three pairs of electrons, and of course, the pair of electrons on the outside of each nitrogen are the non-bonding pairs. Let's compare the triple bond, the double bond, and the single bond. A triple bond is a stronger bond overall, all three combined. A single bond is weaker than three bonds combined. However, the individual bonds within a triple bond or within a double bond are less strong than an individual single bond, but combined together, a triple bond is stronger than a single bond, and a double bond is stronger than a single bond. Bond length is inversely proportional to bond strength. The stronger a bond, the closer the atoms are together. So a single bond has a longer bond than a triple bond. The characteristics of covalent bonding are that atoms uh, that make coval covalent bonds are close together in the periodic table. They have to have similar ionization energy and similar electron affinity in order not to have the transfer of electrons and to have sharing instead. We find atoms that undergo covalent bonding to be 
the nonmetals, remember the dividing line from boron to acetine, get, to the right of that line we find the nonmetals. Covalent bonding forms through the overlap of atomic orbitals and through the overlap of atomic orbitals the electrons spend time on both atoms and it's the sharing of all the electrons that causes the bond to form. Always in covalent bonding we're finding that atoms attain a stable electron configuration of s2p6 an octet or if it's a small atom for instance hydrogen then we get an s2 arrangement. The Lewis dot structures all are all part of the valence bond theory and we use Lewis dot structures for non-metal to non-metal bonding. Um, this is the most common model that we use in chemistry. If you pick up more advanced textbooks of chemistry, for instance organic chemistry or biochemistry, even if you look at biology books, the structures that are written are written according to the valence bond theory Lewis dot structures. There are other theories of bondings but it's they're very complicated and we're not going to go anywhere near them. So far we've been only been using a very simplified way of looking at Lewis dot structures which is basically to smash or squish atoms together and make overlap occur. And it does work for some simple molecules like water. We can see two hydrogens coming together on an oxygen and we end up with an octet on oxygen and a stable electron configuration of two electrons for hydrogen. This gives us two single bonds between the hydrogen and the oxygen, the two hydrogens and the oxygen, and two non-bonding pairs on that oxygen. But there are many times that this system fails. An example is shown here. You can see that if I try to just smash two carbon and oxygen atoms together, it does not give us a stable electron configuration on the carbon. Some students will sometimes say, well, spread out the electrons on carbon and it should work. And if I do that, it still doesn't work. Why doesn't this work? The reason is is that electrons do not necessarily stay on the atom in which they were to begin with. Electrons don't care where they end up unless they are in the lowest energy place. They don't have to stay on the same atom. They always go to the lowest energy place. So if we are wanting to draw a Lewis dot structure, what method should we use? I'm giving you a method, a procedure for writing Lewis dot structures here that's very straightforward and it almost always works. The first thing that you do is you sum up all the electrons that are in the valence shell of the molecule. So here's an example of ammonia. Ammonia has a nitrogen in it, which is S2P3, which gives it five electrons in the valence shell. There are three hydrogens, each one with an S1 outer shell, so three times one electrons from the hydrogens. We sum that up and we get eight electrons total. The next thing that we do is we draw a skeleton. To draw the skeleton, we take the first element that is not hydrogen and place it as a central atom. The uh, remaining atoms follow, except if you have hydrogen first in the formula, you save them out and you attach them to any oxygens that are present. That's only when hydrogen is first in the formula. Otherwise, it's the central atom is the first atom and the remaining atoms surround that central atom. Next, what we do is we take pairs of electrons and place them as bonds between the atoms. That uses up six electrons of the eight electrons total. After we've formed all our bonds, then we place our non-bonding pairs. The non-bonding pairs now make nitrogen have an octet, and we can see that each hydrogen has two electrons. This is the last step that you need to do, which, which is to check that each atom is stable. Each atom other than hydrogen, 
needs to have an octet and every hydrogen should have only one pair of electrons. Never have more than two electrons on a hydrogen. Now what I'd like you to do is to use this method to draw the Lewis stop structure for carbon tetrachloride. Pause your lecture and resume when you're finished. To do the carbon tetrachloride Lewis stop structure, the first thing that we need to do is determine the total number of electrons in the valence shell. There are four electrons from S2P2 of carbon and seven electrons on each chlorine because it's S2P5. You sum up four plus seven times four and you get 32. That's how many electrons we'll need to place in the, the valence shell of this Lewis dot structure. We draw the skeleton of carbon tetrachloride. Carbon is written first, so it goes in the center and the chlorine surround. Next, we place the bonding electrons. The bonding electrons are between the atoms forming the bonds. And then finally, we, we use the remaining electrons, making sure we don't use any more nor any less than the electrons given. We place the re remaining electrons as non-bonding pairs on, on every atom that needs them in order to form a an octet. And this is the final Lewis dot structure that you would have for carbon tetrachloride.